There's a saying that gets mentioned a lot in NASCAR. It's a family sport. And there's a lot that can back up that statement. There's the obvious example with the France family, the ones who have ran the sport for decades, for better or for worse. Although the staple family is rooted primarily in the business side, the majority of the families are involved in the racing aspect. There's the Petties, the Pearsons, the Allisons, the Wallaces, the Jarretts, the Flocks, the Bakers, the Earnharts, the Wood Brothers, the Waltrip Brothers, the Bodine Brothers, the Bush Brothers, the Labani Brothers. I could theoretically go on for days. It's an impressive list, and most of the sport's greatest moments can be tied to these families in some way, shape, or form. However, one family name is not on here, and that name is Hendrick. When NASCAR fans think of that name, they think of a dynasty. As of this recording, Hendrick Motorsports has won 257 races, earned 1,074 top fives, 1,845 top tens, and 12 championships in just the Cup Series alone, with some of the sport's biggest names having driven under the HMS banner. On top of all this, Rick Hendrick is a hell of a businessman. You need an example? Take a drive through Charlotte, North Carolina, and count the number of car dealerships that have his name on it. If there's a car that you want, Mr. Hendrick will most likely be able to sell it to you. He's built a racing empire, and he hasn't shied away from who he wants to have the reins of it once he steps down. However, Jeff Gordon wasn't always seemingly the next in line. Many years ago, it seemed like Hendrick Motorsports was destined to be a family business, and be passed down to his son, Ricky. Born in April of 1980, Ricky grew up with his father's race team, being in victory lane for a number of wins, including the team's first cup win with Jeff Bodine. Ricky's love for the sport grew as he got older. As he entered his teenage years, he got a start in Legends cars, as do most kids in the Charlotte area. He quickly started showing his skill as he began winning. In 1997, he would make the jump to late models, where he would continue to notch victories. Two years later in 1999, Jeff Gordon announced he would be forming a Bush Series team, where the three-time and reigning Cup Series champion would share a ride with the 19-year-old Ricky Hendrick. In Hendrick's Bush Series debut at Myrtle Beach Speedway, he would qualify 5th before an eventual 20th place finish. He would fail to qualify later that year at Richmond and Memphis, and a crash at Rockingham would leave him 37th. The following year, Ricky would continue to run part-time in the Bush Series. While he did manage to score a top 5 in his first race in Nashville, the rest of the season didn't go as well. He would fail to qualify 5 times, and would suffer from multiple concussions from wrecks. While his Bush Series season didn't pan out too well, he did find success in the Truck Series. In six races, he managed four top tens with an average finish of 11.2. With the success he found in the truck series, it was announced that Ricky Hendrick would pilot the number 17 truck for his father's truck team, alongside teammate Jack Sprague for the full 2001 season. Up to this point, Ricky had driven plenty of different cars. However, he had never driven a full season in any series. In Ricky's own words, he never got rid of his rookie stripe, and the truck series would give him the opportunity to do just that. In the season opener at Daytona, Ricky would come home second, and follow that with a fifth place finish at Homestead. In the first 11 races, Ricky only finished outside the top 10 once. Heading into the inaugural race at Kansas, Ricky was fifth in points and riding a wave of consistency. Starting on the outside pole position, Ricky would lead 32 laps and route to its first Truck Series win, becoming the youngest winner in the Truck Series brief history. Flag, I need one more good one, no pressure from behind. And Dion Henske will indeed wave the white flag. So we are one and a half miles away from setting a record. How about putting Ricky Hendrick in the history books as the first winner, if he can hold on, in the history of this gorgeous facility in Wyandotte County, Kansas. We are in Kansas City, Kansas, for the inaugural O'Reilly Auto Parts 250. And now, three quarters of a mile stands between Ricky Hendrick and a GMAC Chevrolet win in NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series competition. Here he comes out. Woo! Hell yeah! Woo! Great job, Ricky. Great job, guys. That is awesome. Ricky would continue to show consistency throughout the rest of the year, only having four finishes outside the top ten for the rest of the season. At season's end, Ricky would sit sixth in points with one win, eight top fives, 19 top tens, and an average finish of 9.0. The following year in 2002, Hendrick Motorsports would shut down both truck teams and move both Ricky Hendrick and teammate Jack Sprague to the Bush Series. The first two races wouldn't go so great, finishing 27th at Daytona and 21st at Rockingham. Then, in the third race of the season at Las Vegas, a crash would dramatically alter Ricky's future. 
trouble, turn one. One car, two cars hard in the wall in Real. turn one. Ricky Hendrick is one of them. Tony Raines in the 33 car. Raines, who had led this race earlier, here come some guys again trying to get laps back. Let's have a look here. Started way back here in the corner. It I, I gotta believe somebody got into the back of Ricky and turned him up the racetrack right in front of Reigns. As a result of the wreck, Ricky suffered a separated shoulder, which would require surgery and force Ricky to miss the next six races. He returned to the tenth race of the season at Richmond, finishing fifteenth, and doing the same at the following race at New Hampshire. The season didn't get much better, only highlighted by an eighth place finish at Kentucky and a seventh place finish at IRP. It was clear that Ricky wasn't the same as he was before. Many speculate that once a driver gets injured, it scares them, and they aren't the same ever again, and many were beginning to speculate the same thing about Ricky. However, something more serious was going on. Ricky's shoulder wasn't at 100%. It had never fully healed, and it was becoming more obvious that this was the case. During a 12-car test in early October, Ricky was 11th fastest, a full 2 miles per hour slower than teammate Jack Sprague. After realizing that his shoulder injury was preventing him from reaching his full potential, Ricky made the decision to retire from driving at just 22 years of age. With the decision being made, Hendrick looked for opportunities to stay involved with the sport, and he didn't have to look far. He stepped into a managerial position at Hendrick Motorsports, being listed as the owner for the number 5 car he drove in 2002. Being out of the driver's seat, Ricky looked for his replacement. He called upon 19-year-old Brian Vickers. The Thomasville, North Carolina native had been running part-time for his father's team for the past two seasons having 25 races under his belt and a lone top 10 to his credit. Ironically, that top 10 came at Richmond in 2002, the same race that Ricky made his return. Vickers started showing promise almost as soon as he hit the track. He was leading laps and racking up finishes inside the top 10. At the 22nd race of the year at IRP, Brian would earn his first win, his second win coming just three races later at Darlington. Two races after that, Brian would win once more at Dover, grabbing the points lead in the process. Despite two finishes outside the top 30 in the season's final seven races, Brian Vickers would hoist the championship after the checkered flag waved at Homestead. With Vickers moving up to Cup in 2004, Ricky called upon another young driver, Kyle Busch. Busch, who had made some select starts for Hendrick Motorsports in the previous year, already was showing some promise, with two top fives and three top tens in just seven starts. Much like Vickers, the 19-year-old started showing results almost immediately earning his first win at Richmond, then four more at Charlotte, Kentucky, IRP, and Michigan. In his short time as an owner, it's clear that Ricky had an eye for talent. Already being a championship winning car owner, the possibility of going back to back wasn't out of the question as Kyle Busch sat second in points. After race 29 of the Busch Series season, the Busch Series had an off weekend as the Cup Series headed to Martinsville. After winning the week prior at Charlotte, Jimmy Johnson looked to close in on the championship lead. On a foggy October day, many associated with Hendrick Motorsports were going to be flying into Martinsville for the race. Rick Hendrick felt ill and decided against flying in order to get some rest. The plane carrying Ricky Hendrick, team president John Hendrick, along with his twin daughters Kimberly and Jennifer, general manager Jeff Turner, chief engine builder Randy Dorton, DuPont executive Joe Jackson, pilot for Tony Stewart, Scott Lathram, and pilots Richard Tracy and Elizabeth Morrison left Concord, North Carolina at around 12 p.m. At around 3 p.m., the airplane was reported as missing. Around halfway through the race, a search team patrolling near Bull Mountain's peak found airplane wreckage on the summit. NASCAR was notified of the situation and decided not to disclose any information to the public. As the checkered flag flew, Jimmy Johnson took the checkered flag, earning his first win at Martinsville. While celebrating, he was notified to head to Pitt Road. The reasoning why was revealed by NBC's Bill Weber. Thank you, Alan. Normally, we would go to Victory Lane at this point for the post-race celebration. That will not be the case today. I'm with Jim Hunter, who's NASCAR's Vice President of Corporate Communications. And Jim, you have some very sad news. Yes, we've been made aware. Uh, the FAA reported they lost contact with a Hendrick Motorsports airplane inbound for Martinsville earlier today, Bill. Uh, we don't have a lot of details or a lot of information, but I know the FAA and the NTSB are 
investigating and uh, we've been in contact with Rick Hendrick uh, and we're, we're in contact with his entire organization uh, and we just don't have a lot of details uh, at the moment. Uh, but we're going to say an extra prayer for everyone in the Hendrick organization uh, at this time. Upon the conclusion of the race, NASCAR called any and all Hendrick personnel to the NASCAR trailer, where details of the accident were disclosed to the team. At approximately 11.05 p.m., the Summit response team found the bodies of everyone on board. A team of firefighters discovered a scar on the mountain. The airplane had crashed into the side of the mountain as a result of navigational issues and inclement weather. At the following race in Atlanta, a moment of silence before both the Bush Series and Cup Series races was held. All Hendrick Motorsports cars carried tributes to those who passed away the week prior. Jimmy Johnson would win the race, offering a bit of closure. In Victory Lane, the rest of his teammates and crew turned their hats backward in Victory Lane as a tribute to Ricky which they still do today. While he retired from driving at such a young age, Ricky definitely showed promise as a car owner. In just two seasons, he won an owner's title and was instrumental in bringing in one of the best drivers of the late 2000s and 2010s to Hendrick Motorsports. Unfortunately for us all, Ricky tragically passed away at age 24. We will never know what Ricky would be doing today. In the end, we're only left to wonder what could have been. Thank you all for watching. I'm Jesse King, and I'll see y'all around. You know, I look at my position here in motorsports and, and, and think that, hey, maybe one day that, you know, I'll have his position, you know, and, and I'll have to be, you know, the boss. I'm still learning day to day. The only thing I want to do is help the organization be successful.